Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Karen um, Richardson, and I'm part of the Care for Creation Task Force here at Midvale. Um, in this season of creation, we're happy for the opportunity to present back-to-back -back adult forums. We have been talking about having a forums on salt, salt usage, salt in the environment, how personal changes are, uh, we, how we can change our salt usage to improve the environment. And for a while, and I've also wanted to in include <clears throat> Badger Talks presenter as well from the UW. So I was really happy when Dr. Dugan was available to present to us today because we can combine those two. So just a brief uh, introduction. Pat Badger Talks follows in the tradition of the Wisconsin idea that many of us know about, that education should influence people's lives beyond the classroom by engaging Wisconsin residents on topics they care about. Um, Dr. Dugan is a limnologist who studies how terrestrial and uh, atmospheric changes such as warming air temperatures or land use patterns alter biochemical fluxes and aquatic processes in lakes. Her research sites span from Wisconsin to Antarctica. So I want to welcome Dr. Dugan and thank you for coming today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for everyone being here. Um, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm a professor at the UW Madison Center for Limnology, which most of you probably have walked by at some point if you live in Madison. It's the, it's the big cement bunker building that's sort of between the Lake Shore Path and the Wisconsin uh, Union. Um, and so limnology is the study of inland waters. So my research is mostly about water quality, um, especially in Wisconsin lakes. So I think about lots of different forms of contamination and pollution that affect our, our surface waters and have been thinking a lot about road salt um, as a contaminant for a number of years now. And, you know, I'm here to basically give the spiel on why salt is a contaminant and you know, what we might be able to do to help with that problem. Um, and so have a, some slides that sort of show both, you know, how much salt we're using, where, where, we, where it's a problem, what we may be able to do, and then definitely uh, happy to spend lots of time just answering questions because it's a, it's a big issue uh, and there's lots of parts of it. Um, and so it's kind of fun to uh, talk about different aspects of that. So, um, I mean, you, you probably invited me here because you're familiar with road salt being in the news as a, as a problem. So the last few years, especially, there's been a lot more, more headlines, primarily in the winter about salt being a problem for drinking water, uh, for just river habitats, for lakes. Um, and, you know, we're in a, sort of the hot spot of that. You see it a lot in Minnesota and Wisconsin, this discussion, and also sort of in the Northeast United States. Um, you also probably are just familiar with it from being a, a resident of a city. <laughs> um, it's hard not to walk around in the winter and just see sort of piles of road salt that are clearly not doing anything. Um, you know, at a certain point, if the roads are completely dry, and you're seeing piles of salt. At that point, it's, it is purely just a pollutant. You're not, it's not melting anything. Um, and so, you know, being cognizant of sort of the overuse is really, really important. Um, and, you know, you see, you see these crazy stories, like people go to rivers and find marine species. So this is a story in Toronto where Someone probably had an aquarium and were tired of their crabs and put their just like toss their crabs into the local river, and the crabs were fine. They survived because the rivers are so salty from road salt that you know you're almost pushing these habitats to a marine environment. You know, which clearly will have cascading consequences for any kind of freshwater organism. Um, so we use we use a lot of salts as humans. Um, and, you know, we, we use it because it's effective. It's also relatively cheap when we think about things that we have to purchase in, in huge quantities. So we'll talk about sort of the, the price of salt, um, but also this argument that salt's natural. You know, it's, it's not a synthetic chemical. We're not necessarily producing it in the lab. We're mining it from the earth. Um, but it's certainly not natural to, to add millions of tons of it to the, the, the landscape every year. Um, Wisconsin actually has no natural salt deposits. Um, 
which is why we have to import all our salt. So certainly in Wisconsin, it is not natural to have like, lots of salt around. Uh, we have naturally incredibly sort of fresh waters um, with very, very low salinities. Um, and so anytime we see sort of higher salinity values in any water in Wisconsin, it is definitely human uh, related. And the, you know, the big downside is that every ounce of salt that we use just ends up in our soil and our water. And so that's through water softeners, that's through things like road salt, that's through fertilizer. But you know, every, it's not getting removed. It's not getting filtered out of our wastewater. Um, it's just going into our soil and water. Eventually it flushes downstream. You know, like our wastewater goes to the Rock River, goes to the Mississippi, ends up in the ocean. At which point that's fine, the ocean is salty, uh, but certainly between here and there, um, we're, we're contaminating those freshwater environments. And then it's also incredibly expensive um, at the scale that we use salt at. So thinking just about road salt, um, the United States uses about 23 million tons a year. So that costs money to mine, it costs money to transport, it costs money to pay people to put it down. It costs money to have the machines to put it down. So we're spending just millions and millions of dollars on this every year. Um, and so any reduction in the use of salt would save a lot of money for the, you know, in this case, the state, which can be used to maybe like fill potholes or some other better use of the DOT's time. Um, so Wisconsin specifically uses about half a million tons of road salt a year. And that varies year to year. It means weather dependent. So um, the, more store, the more winter storms you have, the more tons of road salt you use. Um, and certainly we are, our winter weather is changing. And while it might be getting warmer, we also get these big sort of like polar vortex storm events. Um, and so there's, there's definitely, it's unclear whether or not we're actually going to get more extreme winter weather just sort of in these weird uh, spurts. And then right now, um, road salt costs about $70 a ton. At the, like, that's the state's bid. Um, and that number is only going to increase. It used to be you know, $30 a ton 10, 15 years ago. So it's already doubled in price. And it's going to keep increasing. And so that total annual expenditure of $83 million uh, is going to increase. And that's just, um, you know, the road salt related cost. So, you know, I, I'm going to tell you about reducing salt use from an environmental perspective, but there's a huge fiscal perspective as well. And so the Department of Transportation is also trying to reduce their salt use because they want to save money um, at the same time helping the environment. So really, we're all in this together and reduction is going to be important. So, you know, where are we using salt? There's um, there are a lot of different sources. I'm gonna talk mostly about road salt because it is the biggest uh, source of salt to the environment in Wisconsin. This is a study that was done in Minnesota. We don't really have a similar one, but the states are extremely similar when it comes to sort of population, urban density, agriculture. Um, and so in Minnesota, uh, you know, they found that road salt was by far the, the biggest um, source of salt. You also have a lot uh, associated with agriculture. So um, we use potassium chloride, so potash as a fertilizer. So that's a, a salt. Um, livestock excretion. So manure comes with a whole lot of uh, problems for surface water quality. A, mo a more one of a minor one is salts. Um, and then water softeners. So, you know, every time you fill up your water softener with salt, that salt just gets discharged into the wastewater um, and downstream to whatever, wherever your wastewater is discharged. So water softeners are also um, a really large contributor of salt. And there's been a lot of, at least in Madison, um, advocacy from the sewage <laughs> district to try to get people to sort of upgrade their water softeners. So it's like any appliance, if your water softener is a few decades old, it is probably using way more salt than is necessary. So. Um, and there's even sort of salt-free water softeners these days too. So there's some other cool technological advances. 
Um, and it's when you study pollution theory, it's really interesting because uh, we have this tendency to want to allow some certain level of pollution and to say that, you know, well, it's okay to pollute this much and stay under a certain threshold. But once we're above this threshold, you know, that's when problems are going to occur. And in reality, that's not really how biology works. There are, it's a spectrum, you know, as you add more, it just gets worse and worse for anything that's trying to live in your, that environment. But in, you know, salt, like anything else has, has uh, government mandated thresholds. Um, and so these are the technical thresholds for uh, chloride, which is uh, one anion in this sort of the salt compound. Um, and you can see that they're different between the EPA and Wisconsin and the Canadian uh, thresholds. And they come up with these thresholds basically by taking uh, different organisms. So in this in case of water, things like zooplankton and fish, amphibians, they put them in tanks, they add salt and they see when they die. And then they come up with these numbers. Um, and you know, there's certain organisms that are would be fine living in salty water. And there's lots of organisms that absolutely would die immediately. So um, especially when we think about our sort of native freshwater organisms, some of these thresholds might be too high. But these thresholds in reality are, are actually quite low. <laughs> um, so that 230 milligrams per liter of chloride, the EPA uh, toxicity threshold, is actually only one, you sort of a, try to scale that down, is just one teaspoon of rose salt in a five gallon bucket of water. So it doesn't take a lot of salt to, to uh, surpass these thresholds, especially when you think about, you know, five gallon buckets are usually what you see salt in. People are sort of dumping it out. So considering it only takes one teaspoon to pollute a five gallon bucket of water, it doesn't take a whole lot of salt to pollute, you know, your local stream um, if you're coating things like parking lots in salt. And salt could end up, you know, it basically ends up everywhere. So this is an example, you know, here, these are, this is like my Lake Mendota uh, map, but we have things like wastewater discharge. We have things like road salt application. It's all sort of dependent on climate and weather. Um, but we have many ways that salt enters the environment. And the result is that we just see concentrations of salt kind of just going up through time. Um, so, oh, show that one. So this is an example in Milwaukee of some of the sort of the three major rivers in the city of Milwaukee. So the Kanekanek Menominee and Milwaukee all converge to the Milwaukee Harbor, um, and you can see these concentrations in this river just sort of go up every winter. So every winter, this these rivers just get pummeled with salt. Um, these dash lines are those EPA thresholds. Uh, Let's see, so this bottom one is the chronic toxicity threshold, this higher one is the acute. And, uh, you know, every year you're just going way past these thresholds as salt gets put on the roads and then just ends up directly in these rivers. Um, this is the Spring Harbor storm sewer. Uh, so nearby in the winter, uh, this, these concentrations in the winter are basically like halfway to ocean salinity. So these are, these are no longer anywhere close to being freshwater concentrations. Um, these are the Madison Lakes. You can see they've just gone up over time. Um, so road salting started in the, in the 40s, um, really took off sort of post-World War II. Wisconsin for a long time had sort of a clear roads policy where they promised that there wouldn't be any ice or snow on the roads anywhere. Uh, and they, in this, like the 80s, they realized that was a terrible idea um and revoked that but you know these concentrations have just sort of they just kept going up um and you the size of the lake matters so mendota has slightly lower concentrations than monona which is lower than wingra um but there's really there hasn't been any signs yet of these leveling off or even decreasing and there's there you know for years there's been a lot of effort to think especially about wingra because it's a pretty urban watershed um, and yet there's just probably so much salt that's just laying around in the soils and the landscape that's still 
continually kind of flushing into these lakes, as well as sort of the additional salt that we put down every year. Um, and, you know, you don't, you can look at specific examples like I just showed, or you can look at the entire state of Wisconsin or Minnesota. And you can, you know, if you know these, the population density of these states, you can easily see that anywhere there's people, there is a problem. Um, so this is a map of Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, anything that's, and this is all of the, the lakes and streams that have data associated with salinity concentrations, but this is chloride, anywhere that's a black dot, and basically purple would be sort of more within like the natural range of what you'd expect. Anything that's that sort of pinky red color to orange to yellow uh, is sort of way above natural concentrations. So, you know, anywhere in Southern Minnesota, Southeast Wisconsin, um, we don't really see any kind of natural background concentrations anymore. These have all been elevated uh, due to, you know, the combination of road salt and agriculture. And, you know, luckily there's still places in these states in the Northwoods and, you know, the boundary waters up in Minnesota where the streams and rivers haven't really been impacted, which is, is good to see. Although if you do zoom in closely, um, you'll see that any, any lake beside a highway, that is not true of. Um, and so, the, you know, overall, this is just, it's a threat to both the ecosystems, but also to people. Um, we all need fresh water. You know, we get our fresh water either from surface water or from groundwater, both of which we are polluting with salt. So in Madison, we get our drinking water from groundwater. Um, there's certainly wells in Madison that are increasing in salinity. Um, well 14, which is one of the ones here on the west side that's quite near here. I don't actually know if you'd be getting well 14 water at this, this location, but you can look it up. You can go onto uh, the Wisconsin uh, or Madison water utility and see what wells you're getting your water from and see how salty they are. Um, but, you know, as, you're, as the water gets saltier, uh, it pr poses problems both for taste, like no one wants to be drinking salt water. Um, and also, especially if you have any kind of health condition where uh, your salt intake should be restricted. It's kind of amazing how much salt you might be getting just from your drinking water, um, which, you know, water providers are aware of, uh, but they're also aware that, uh, you know, drilling new wells and finding new water is very expensive. And so there's definitely uh, a realization that we need to stem this problem before we lose some of those resources. Um, and then, you know, additionally, any organism that's living in those freshwater environments is, is, is prone to st basically just stress as you start increasing the salt concentration. So, um, so sort of a, 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 a dual need to protect um, our rivers and lakes and groundwater. And this is, you know, the example from Madison. Um, this is the data from well 14. Um, the concentration since, well, this measurement in 2000 of 58 milligrams per liter, um, kind of just been sneaking upwards. And so, you know, Madison's aware of this. Um, this is a map of the, 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 the groundwater aquifer beneath Madison, and we get our groundwater from a really deep aquifer. What's happening is that there's actually sort of leakage from upper layers um, into some of these well casings. And so, the closer you are to the surface, the salty you are. So it takes a while for that salt to, to penetrate down, but um, it's definitely impacting some of these wells. And so normally what they do now is actually mix wells together. So they'll mix well 14 water with a different well to try and freshen it. Um, and it also, this also has impacts for um, biology, not only thinking about, you know, most people are concerned about fish and certainly fish are important, um, but also important for sort of smaller organisms. So, you know, one thing we're seeing in Madison uh, are more kind of big algal blooms. Uh, and so we, we talk a lot about harmful algal blooms and these sort of blue-green cyanobacterial blooms, which are the really gross ones that if you hear in the, like near the lakes in the summer are like floating uh, and, 
there's some indication that those species are much more salt tolerant than other forms of algae, which are more the ones we would prefer. Um, and so as we increase these salt concentrations, we're kind of just, we're giving uh, some of the unwanted species a leg up. Um, also things like zebra mussels, a lot of invasive species are pretty salt tolerant. A lot of them came from sort of more salty environments. Um, and so we're really just harming native freshwater species and uh, improving the habitat for some of these invasive species that we really don't want. Um, so, you know, moving forward, uh, there is hope. So salt is, a you know, once it dissolves in water, it stays dissolved, doesn't stick around in the food chain, doesn't stay in the sediments. So, you know, it does flush downstream. So salt is, is a problem that can be fixed pretty easily just by stopping, by putting less on the landscape. So we stop putting so much salt on the landscape, we will eventually, the you know, rivers and lakes will flush themselves out. So that's a good thing. This isn't sort of the same, you know, we have other contaminants like mercury or phosphorus that stick around in food webs and the sediment and are, you know, once they're there are really hard to get rid of. So it's not hard to get rid of. You just have to stop putting so much in every year. So that's a good thing, it's hopeful. We don't have a lot of problems necessarily that have, you know, easy ways of solving them. Um, and so the, you know, the, the, the big things that people can do are to, to like just straight up use less. And this is something that happens on a range of scales. So this is everyone from like you choosing not to use any salt on your driveway to the city of Madison deciding not to use salt during certain storms, which we see. Um, and that's really hard when you get like a million angry phone calls <laughs> um, to stores, you know, if you're a business owner deciding to only contract with providers that you know, use good policies. I mean, there's in the in the private application world, there's like crazy things like contracts where you get paid more the more salt you use, like things that are you're know, totally not trying to incentivize yet less use. So we're starting to see this, and you know, I can talk about uh, the switch from rock salt to liquid brine application. Um, and this also goes for things like water softeners. So, you know, thinking about your water softener and how it's how it's plumbed into your house, how it's how it's reflushing. Um, and there's an organization in Wisconsin called Wisconsin Salt Wise. Um, and this was their sort of their banner that Salt Awareness Week in January. Um, they have a website, with, it's just wisaltwise.com. And they have a lot of information on, especially water softeners, um, in terms of you know, what to think about when it comes to your appliances. Um, and then the next step after just thinking about everyone using less is thinking about policy options. Um, one of the, 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 you know, the big critiques that people uh, um, talk about when it comes to using less salt is this, this fear of litigation. So everyone's concerned about you know, slip and fall, uh, slip and falls that are then you know, someone gets sued. Um, and that's, that's real. But, you know, especially if you're a business owner or, you know, an institution, you would, you, do, you obviously don't want people getting hurt. You also you definitely don't want to be sued. Um, and so there's uh, some states that are trying to pass legislation to um, protect, basically, um, from lit protect um, business owners and institutions from litigation when it comes to, um, to winter related uh, lawsuits be basically saying, you know, if you've done your due diligence, you're covered. Um, and the only state that's managed to pass that is New Hampshire. Um, and so that's sort of the, everyone's kind of watching New Hampshire to see what happens, but um, there's pushback. I mean, it's state legislation. So there's people on the other side who want lawsuits. Um, so it's actually kind of, that's been really hard for most states to pass. Minnesota's been trying to pass it for a long time. Um, and just changing the incentive structure. So changing the, the way people salt, especially thinking about things like parking lots, where you're not driving quickly, you know, you're not really as, at, 
as at a, like as high of a risk as maybe the interstate. So thinking more about um, you know where where we should actually be using salt. Like maybe we salt the the handicap spots and we just plow everywhere else. Um, there's a lot of ways to really reduce the amount of salt we're using and still maintain public safety. Um, we're not even close to saying like don't salt. We're just at the stage of saying let's try and use a whole lot less. Um, and we're seeing um, at the state level, counties switch to to bright application and uh, actually starting to reduce their salt use by like 50% just by switching to liquid application. So things are happening, which is exciting, uh, but it's not regulated at all. So it's not a pollutant. Um, you can, if you were to go out, buy like a dump truck of salt and just dump it in the middle of the road, you probably could be uh, fined for some kind of just like negligent dumping, but salt is not as a specific contaminant, not regulated. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. Just, I feel like I gave you a good enough overview and I just am curious what your questions are and happy to talk more about anything to do with lakes or water softeners or road salts. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. At what temperature does salt be effective for removing ice? Yeah, ice box? yeah. So that's another thing to think about is you know when is it like when should we be applying road salt? So there's different chemical formulas. Most of what we use is sodium chloride, which is just table salt, and it's we use it because it's the cheapest um, by far, and that's what the city uses in the county, um, and that works down to about. Um, 15 Fahrenheit. Sorry, I think in Celsius. I need to like convert in my head. Minus 10 Celsius. Um, and so below that, it's so how salt works is it actually, um, you know, it, the more salt you use, it reduces the freezing point to a certain a certain uh, temperature. At which point, the ions just aren't getting in the way, and you can still freeze salt. If you switch to a salt compound that is has a different uh, positive ion. So calcium chloride or magnesium chloride, you can depress that freezing point a lot lower. So in really cold situations, calcium chloride will still melt salt down to, you know, five Fahrenheit zero. Um, and so those are things that the city thinks about. So sometimes when there's a storm during really cold weather, they're, they're not gonna salt because it's not gonna do anything. Um, also when it's really cold, you're not getting those like freeze thaw events. You're not forming as much ice. So there's a lot of, as you sort of go, go further north, there's lots of cities that, you know, at a certain latitude don't use this road salt because it's not doing anything. And also the conditions aren't actually as dangerous because they're not, there's not as much ice. It's actually just kind of, you know, snow, just packed snow. Um, but Madison is in this sort of terrible winter climate where we get this, we're right around 30. We just, freeze and thaw all the time and it's it's really effective at creating ice <laughs> um and you know ice is what's what's dangerous snow isn't dangerous um and so um yeah those temperatures are important those other chemicals so other salts calcium and magnesium chloride are will work at colder temperatures they come with some downsides they're a bit more corrosive so they don't they you know salt is corrodes cement machinery, your car, um, and those ones are actually worse. So you'll see like things rust faster. So uh, applicators don't like using them because it's even hard on their own vehicles. Um, yeah, so there's some interesting differences there. Um, and you'll, I don't know, you have, I'm going on to side tangents now on your question, but calcium chloride is the uh, effluent that's associated with water softeners. So there's, you'll, you might see things in the news about people actually reclaiming their water softener effluent. So instead of flushing it into the wastewater, like usually just plumbed into the sewer, people are actually capturing that. Some people are trying to use it as brine for de-icing um, and that's all calcium chloride. So it comes with its own problems of being more corrosive and yeah, we don't need more rust on our cars. 
Online? Okay. Like, Okay, so you want me to speak? You're on, Mark. Okay, uh, kind of a two-part two question on the brine. I mean, brine, I know the word brine means there's salt in it. Is it preferable simply because the concentration of salt is a lot less than, than what is drunk, you know, solidly onto the, uh, and the pavement? And can you talk a little bit about how that works? I mean, obviously you see them do that before a storm, but once it starts snowing, I, I don't think, you know, that's an answer, right? They can't necessarily see it. Yeah. So uh, the question was about brine. So yeah, so the word brine just means salty water. <laughs> um, in the world of road de-icing, brine is, is salty water at a specific concentration, uh, which is about 23% salt, which is actually very salty, like much, much saltier than the ocean. Um, so if you were to make your own brine, like if you were to put salt and water in a bucket to make that concentration, you'd be shocked at how much salt is in that bucket. Um, and it works. So, you know, traditionally we just put rock salt on the road and when it snows and water hits it, it turns into brine. So really we're just skipping that first step of turning rock salt into brine. Um, and it's, a, it's, you use a lot less just because how it's put down um, so because it's sprayed on roads, you can get a lot more even coating than you can with solid rock salt. Um, like you've all been behind a, like a, a plow and it's applying rock salt and just like hits the road and bounces. So, so much of that is just bouncing into the ditch. Um, when you spray a road with brine, you're really just getting a lot better, uh, adhesion and coating without losing all that extra salt. So it's more just that you can apply it in a manner that's a lot more effective than, than it being a lower concentration. Um, so that's sort of why you can use a lot less. Um, yeah, once it, so the most, um, most people who use brines will pre-coat the roads so that when, when snow starts, it'll immediately start melting. And then if there is actually an accumulation of snow, uh, they'll often go out and plow and add just solid on top. There's not a lot of people who spray brine on top of snow that apparently isn't a practice they do yet, but there are some, uh, some places that are switching to 100% liquid. Um, so in Wisconsin, if you're interested, Jefferson County, which is the county east of Madison or east of Dane County, um, is the leader in liquid application in the state. So uh, if you're ever out in Jefferson County in the winter, the roads are pretty darn good. Um, and they do the interstate with liquid. Um, they have a huge tanker truck that sprays 94 uh, all winter. Um, and they've seen about a 50% reduction in their, in their annual salt use, which is massive. Um, and they've, they've been doing that now, you know, maybe for five years or so. And um, you can actually see the, the improvement in road quality like, as you cross the county lines. If you go from Milwaukee to Madison, you'll see this nice stretch of Jefferson County. Um, the weird thing about brine, and this, there's, I don't understand this, but every, I often do like radio call-in shows in the winter, like WPR. And every year, someone will call in saying that they think it rusts their car more. And I don't know how, I don't understand how there's any validity to that because it's the same chemical. Like instead of us putting down rock salt and water, you know, snow dissolving it, we're using that same salt and just adding water at the shop. Um, and so I don't know if it's like sprayed up more on your car. I don't, I don't understand it, but mechanics will call in and be like, cars seem rustier. So that's the only negative thing I've heard so far. And I also don't understand how it's true, but every, but people, people ask me that every year. Yeah. Uh well, when I was small, and don't anyone make any small comment about <laughs> that. Uh, but anyway, when I was small, a lot of sand was used. Yeah. Are we, is there any move to graduate to that or to move to that? Yeah, I think, I mean, so sand is providing traction. I mean, I think 
you know, if you, if you go to any place that has like really long winters, people are just like, yeah, we just wear boots and walk on snow, put sand down. And that is effective. I mean, I think it's mostly a mindset of switching from wanting bare pavement all winter to being okay with just sand on top of snow. You're putting the, you're putting that more on the, on people in terms of like making sure that you have good footwear and, you know, can be, can walk safely. Um, there's definitely, you see sand use in Madison where sand is not, using sand here is not a problem in terms of water quality. There are places in the world that if you put enough, like if you use enough sand, you're actually going to like create turbidity problems in your lakes and rivers. You see that, um, like Lake Tahoe is a good example. It's, you know, very clear and it's, it's clarity is decreasing because they think of like lots of sand use. Wisconsin is very sandy as a state naturally. So it's not, a, you know, adding sand is not a problem. Um, and, you know, you see sand buckets around town in the winter, like the barrels that the city puts out. So those, they say sand, they're actually 95% sand, 5% salt. So there's still a little bit of salt in them. Um, and the city finds that really effective, like just enough salt to do, to get rid of a bit of ice, but then a lot of sand to provide traction. Um, yeah, I mean, I live like, on a hill in Madison and they just sand it all winter. So the city doesn't salt any of the, the minor streets, just the major, the major streets and the bus routes. So there's just like by, by April, there's just like a foot of sand. <laughs> They've just been sanding it all winter. And then they just come and sweep it up in the spring and seems to work pretty well. So, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same thing with driving. Like, you know, if you have snow tires and things, you can be pretty safe, but most of us don't, you know, we're just used to clear roads. So follow up to that is brining effective in city streets as much as on highways or does it, you know, does the volume and speed of the yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's effective in that it's still going to depress, you know, it's still going to melt anything that's between, you know, 15 and 30 Fahrenheit. Um, but traffic does help melt just because they kind of heat up the pavement. So those big streets definitely seem to get, you know, the more clear quickly just because of traffic. Absolutely. So, but it's still effective. Um, you know, you, I hear people spraying brine on their, like, on their steps. Um, you know, I still advocate for trying to shovel it as much as you can, but also I'm aware that some things are really hard to clear from ice. And there's some winters where we get like an ice storm. Now everything's icy. <laughs> you just want it to be gone. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it is effective ev everywhere that you use salt. Yeah, the city of Madison has... Uh, a brine facility. Um, so you'll see in the winter, if there's going to be a storm, you'll see them go out and pre-treat. And that's where you see the stripes on the road. Um, so, you know, once you, if you see a storm forecast, you'll, you'll start noticing those stripes. Um, and, you know, they, they're getting a lot more sophisticated in sort of when they salt. So they look at the weather and look at temperatures. Also a storm in December is a lot different than a storm in April because of the sun. So you get a storm in April, even if it's cold, there's this, there's so much daylight, the sun's so high in the sky that it's pretty effective at melting. So they're, they rarely will salt in April just because they know the sun's gonna melt it. Um, whereas in December, it just like, the sun's not doing anything. So uh, there's a lot of, yeah, they, they, I don't know, use more sort of equations to decide what to do these days than they used to, which was just like go out and salt all the time. And, you know, a couple of years ago they did salt all of, there was like, everything was ice and they salted this, the, all of the streets. Cause it just was, it was like icy for a week. And I think decided that they, you know, they were probably just getting enough angry calls that they were like, you know what, we're just going to go salt everything. So once in a while, you know, the weather's just so bad that they changed the rules too. Uh, Tom, yeah. Yeah, uh, we see you. I wonder, I wonder how much those saltless uh, water softeners, how much they cost. And I wonder if you would recommend uh, any particular brand or brands. Yeah, so I, I wish I had a better answer to that question. I don't 
no, they're more expensive. Um, they Wisconsin salt wise, the, you should check out their website cause they have a lot of, uh, softener information. So Wisconsin salt wise was actually started by the sewage districts. So they were sewage districts more concerned about softeners and they are about road salt because that's the water they're getting. Um, and that's where you'll find good information on things like what they recommend. Um, they're also really responsive if you shoot them an email, if you have you know, specific questions. Um, but even softeners that use salt, uh, the new ones are just so much more efficient um, with how they use salt. So even if you don't go saltless, it's, it's, you'll see a tremendous reduction in salt use if you just upgrade your water softener, depending on how old it was and how it's plumbed, like making sure it's, you know, just plumbed to your hot water and not all of your water. Um, Cause really you're just trying to protect your major appliances, like your water heater. Um, so yeah, there's, there's definitely tricks to, to reduce that. Yeah. There's a um, storage room on this facility that's just stack full of salt. I'm wondering, is there a way of dispersing of it other so, than oh. it on sidewalks? Oh, man. No, I don't know. Because uh, it's going to go somewhere, right? It's either going to go to your water or landfill. Uh, yeah, I've never been asked that question. There's probably no good way of getting rid of it. Uh, yeah, because a, a landfill is eventually going to leach it too, probably in some capacity, but um, I don't know. That You might just have to have that room to save salt forever. <laughs> Going, you know, taking it to the ocean and just, <laughs> you know, there's all this, all the coastal cities don't really care about road salt because they're just like, well, it just runs off in the ocean. I'm like, well, I guess that's true. So... Well, there are enough uh, people who are members of Midvale that we probably could just say free salt for people to use in their home water softeners. <laughs> oh, to get rid of it, yeah. yeah. To, to actually yeah. use it, yeah. I mean, why not? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, salt, you know, road salt is a, the salt you put in your water softener tech typically is a little bit better quality than the stuff you buy just for outside. So it depends on what you've purchased. Um, because the, the stuff you buy for outside often has like lots of other stuff in it, just because they, they just where they mine it, they, there's like just other grit, dirt, whatever, different things. Um, and so it's cheaper. Um, and whereas the water, the salt you put in your water stuff, there tends to be just more pure, just so you don't get other like particles in there. So it kind of depends on the, yeah, what the, what you purchased, but. Um, yeah, I see online in the bike community, a lot of people feel that when they put the brine on the bike paths, it just creates ruts and it doesn't really do the trick. Yeah. Oh man. Good question. I get, I'm a, so I bike, I bike to work year round. So I feel like I'm invested in this question. Um, it, even without salt, you get ruts in the snow and ice. So I'm, I'm not sure it's necessarily the salt that's creating those. I'm, I'd push back a bit on like salt making things worse for, con for like trail conditions. Um, it, it certainly makes things worse for your bike. Uh, I just replaced my whole drivetrain this summer because it was like completely rusted. Um, so the problem I guess in Madison specifically. And so the city, I would say the city of Madison is very cognizant of these issues and are trying their best to like approach things correctly. Bike paths are actually managed by different city agencies. So some of them are parks, some of them are roads, depending on where they are. Um, but you get sections that are very dark and don't see the sun. So there's sections of like the Southwest commuter, especially where it goes by, um, closer to kind of like where Trader Joe's is, where it's, I mean, these are all train tracks, right? So some of them are really deep. You just never get any solar radiation. There's nothing melting the snow. So they plow them, but so once in a while they'll go and they'll go and salt them to try and get rid of that ice because it's dangerous for everyone. So there, I don't know, the city's, 
and they're they're doing experiments. They're like salting some sections and not, and seeing if salt is impacting it. So they're they're trying to figure it out. Um, yeah, I mean, as a cyclist, obviously, I would like no ice and no ruts, um, but would also love for them not to use any salt on them. Absolutely. Yeah. Or on the streets, which also rusts my bike. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, it's hard because they're also, I mean, they're plowing at the same time. So, um, I'm not convinced that it necessarily will make things worse than salting, but I don't, I don't know. I don't really know. Yeah. But the people who are angry about it are very angry about it. So, <laughs> yeah. Just to go back to the, the closet full of unused. Oh, yeah. Salt. We could figure out which kind of salt it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You and can put people it back. do put salt on their driveways, whether they should or not. People. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you, yeah, you just, the bag will tell you if it's, right. yeah, rock for roads or, yeah. It just, yeah. And I mean, I, you know, I think it's interesting, even as you know, you your parish can talk about, you know, how you do maintenance on your parking lots in the winter. You know, it's churches are communities where there are, you know, there's mobility issues and things like that. And so I think these are perfect places to have these kind of discussions about, you know, what we should be doing in the winter. You know, how much how much can we get out and shovel versus using salt. Um, you know, parking lot cells would tend to be flat. So that's an advantage. Um, you know, try to think about if you are going to use salt, there's there specific spots that would make it easy uh, for people to get around. So, I, you know, change, parking lot change starts with people who own the parking lots. So <laughs> I think, you know, going into winter, it might be a worthwhile discussion to be having here. I don't know what you guys currently do. I bike by a church on campus all the time that I have gone into every winter to try and convince them to use less road salt and I've gotten nowhere. So, uh, you know, I try. <laughs> we replaced our water softener several years ago. What a difference it made. Mm. Oh, it's, we hardly have to buy salt anymore. Fantastic. Yeah. Cause there are water softeners where you're like filling it up every week. Um, yeah. The new ones are, yeah. I mean, I think I just, happened to buy a house that had a new water soft, newish water softer. I never fill it up. I mean, if I think we put like four bags in it the whole time we go in the house. Um, so they, yeah, it's like, you know, if it's like, if you get a new fridge or a new washing machine, you're like they're just so much more efficient. So, and there's also people who don't use water softeners. They, they think that the, the lifespan of the water heater is not all that affected. So some people, some people don't. Um, there's some, so SaltWise has done some studies with um, people who, like landlords, who just don't have water softeners in their units because they're like, water heater's going to die in 10 years anyway. I'm just going to not also have a water softener. Um, and there's, you know, there's, there's also fixtures you can add like just to your shower or things to make things better. But so people have different tactics. Well, I, I would just like to point out, um, years ago, our water softener died and we didn't know it. Mm. Well, we had to replace every single um, rubber part of the washing machine because they all got pitted from the hard. Oh, sure. So those landlords are being foolish, probably. Yeah. Although, I mean, I just, I use cold water in my washing machine and it's not, you know, I only, we our softeners only hooked up to our hot water. So, yeah. you know, the cold never had a problem with washing machine and cold water that's not softened so it's really when you're heating up water and it's taking those dissolved minerals out of it so uh yeah um kind of going back to environmental impacts large, yeah. large scale um it sounds like salt moves with the groundwater doesn't adhere to the soil is that true? Mostly. Okay. Yeah. It'll, I mean, there's a little bit of retention in port, but it's mostly, it'll mostly go where the water goes. Um, so yeah, there's lots of, 
mean, groundwater is, it's going to become a huge problem in certain areas. Um, you already see uh, reports of people who live just like, you know, unfortunately right beside an interstate where their, their groundwater wells are undrinkable. Um, and it's, it has to do with which way the water's flowing. And you'll see, you'll see people who like on the east side of the highway are all impacted and on the west side aren't just because the water's kind of flowing one direction. So um, yeah, it hits and it hits everyone from like just residents and their own drinking water to businesses who use water. So restaurants, um, there's agricultural problems when people are trying to give their, like, give their animals water to drink. Um, and so there's some reports of farms where they, they just like, they think their cattle weren't doing well because they were just drinking salty water. <laughs> so there's, you know, that you forget that it's more than just like people drinking water too. Like you use it for a lot of things. Um, and yeah, groundwater is, yeah, it's, it's being impacted all over the state um, and other states. Yeah. And you, you already talked about how it affects uh, marine life. Are there micro, like the light love microorganisms in the salt in the ground that it can impact? I'm just thinking about areas that are really rural, you know, you're in the interstate or something. Does it really harm that sub and, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's going to hurt everything that's a living cell. So cells are trying to maintain their sort of ionic balance. So yes, there's also the smaller the organism you get, the quicker they can evolve to. So there's some, some evolution of microbes. So you know, if you've been salting an environment for, at this point, like 70 years, there's, it's probably full of a, it's probably got a microbiome that's evolved to handle that salt load because microbes are crazy and do cool things. Um, but you'll see, you know, you see it with trees along interstates, like lots of different problems. So, um, and you know, at the same time, engineers are trying to build roads where that water can get off the road quickly and percolate percolate through so there you know we're also engineering environments where we're trying to get water to flush and not just sort of build up salts right at the surface either um so yeah i mean it's it impacts it impacts anything that's living um and different organisms are just able to deal with it in different ways just like some people can eat like tons of salt but not be impacted and other people can't um, so you just see that spectrum, that diversity and how the organisms can, yeah, maintain, uh, sort of a healthy cellular system in the context of different salt concentrations. So how did you get so interested in salt? Uh, oh, it's great. Uh, yeah, Thank, thanks for asking that. Uh, mostly we just saw the salt concentrations increasing in all of the lakes that we study. So it's like kind of a red flag, <laughs> a little bit of maybe this is important. Maybe we should be talking about this. Um, and then, you know, the more you look, the more you see it everywhere. Um, so it was just one of those sort of observations that most people neglected um, because I don't know, it was low enough, you know, like, oh, it's, yeah, it's going increasing, but it's low enough. But, you know, if it just keeps on increasing, it just becomes more and more of a problem. So, um, and it's, it's ubiquitous across the Midwest and the Northeast and many parts of Canada. So um, yeah, people are definitely starting to become a lot more aware of it. And I think, you know, once it starts impacting drinking water, then, then it gets serious because people's lives and a whole lot of money are at stake. Finding, finding clean drinking water is not cheap. So, um, you know, better to protect it now than to try and try and figure out how to deal with it in the future. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious where you're from and what you think of Wisconsin. <laughs> uh, I grew up in Ontario. Uh, so southwestern Ontario, it's very similar to Wisconsin. Very, it's very flat. There's a lot of agriculture. It's a lot of cows. Same climate. So, yeah, not not a whole lot different. Uh, I love Wisconsin's great. Mad I mean, Madison's a fantastic state to live in. So, really happy to be here. It's a good place to be a limnologist when you're living in a city with a bunch of lakes. So, that's you can't ask for better than that. 
Um, but yes, I grew up in road salt country. So, you know, remember walking through piles of road salt on the way to school for sure. So this is it's definitely a lifelong pursuit of, uh, or, you know, always living in places that use a lot of road salt. <laughs> yeah. Um, it seems that uh, I've, I've read a few places that the, the Corps of Engineers is looking at different ways to address its water management systems and in essence increase the flow, the natural flow that was somewhat interrupted with the dams. Mm, and the other mm -hmm. thing. I'm curious if that may, because it seems like what I'm hearing is reduce and flush. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just curious if you've thought or looked at that particular component. Yeah, so I think, I think the time scales are too different for that. So, you know, thinking about flushing from, you know, the rivers with dams and things like that, they're thinking about that more on an annual time scale. So instead of having just like a big peak in the spring, they, they kind of try and revert to what historically river regimes look like. Um, you know, for salt, it's the time scale is a bit longer. So those, those sort of daily, monthly changes in river flow are not going to really change the overall sort of flushing rate because the Corps of Engineers can't add more water. They can only change when they release water. I mean, certainly they would like to add more water to the West because they have none. <laughs> um, so if, you know, if you could add more water, then yes. Like if we entered a, I mean, before, prior to 2021, it was very wet in Wisconsin. Like we've had very wet years. Um, and so that's good for things like flushing. Um, and it's also, you know, if you have less snow, you use less salt, there's like lots of good things that come with that. Um, but, you know, now we, we've had this basically a drought this year until like last week that won't stop raining. But um, so the climate has a huge impact on sort of how things are moving around and when they move around, so. And it's, it's very, you know, Wisconsin's getting warmer. Like we know what's happening with temperature. It's, it's much less clear what the projections are for precipitation. So everyone thought wetter until this year and, and then we'll see. And then this winter is supposed to be, in, well, it's an El Nino year. So it's supposed to be cold, sorry. It's gonna be a cold winter. Um, and so we'll see what happens with snowfall. Like last year we had tons of snow in Madison, best skiing in a decade, right? So see what happens this winter. <laughs> Just buy good boots, that's my take, you know. Buy good boots, keep your feet warm, walk through snow. <laughs> well, as a skier, I'm gonna hope for another snowy way was winter this year. So I wanna thank you so much for this really, it was super interesting, a lot of great questions on this big picture about salt and encourage people to join in. Next week, we're gonna have somebody from Madison Metropolitan Sewage District Ooh. talking. And so I think that you re mentioned the um, SaltWise. Yeah. That they can talk about some of the real specifics, um, maybe that we can take actions as well. So I think that'll be kind of a nice segue, you know, to, to combine the both uh, uh, learning experiences. So. Um, that sounds great, yeah. Sewage just, it's always great to talk to people from the sewage district. They know all the crazy things that happen. <laughs> so thanks again. I appreciate it. Yeah, that was time. fun. Thanks for yes. thanks for being here. I did, yeah. I live close by.